So, what is event sourcing? I'll sit down because I'll be using the keyboard. It's live coding, well, sort of live coding. Um, somebody which I admire and respect a lot, his name is Martin Fowler, English guy, at least he's got an English accent. And he says, event sourcing ensures that all changes to application state are stored as a sequence of events. Okay, yeah, I understand that. Uh, not just can we query these events, we can also use the event log to reconstruct past states, and as a foundation to automatically adjust the state, I got, I got lost at that stage. <laughs> um, I read this like 10 times, and I realized it's actually very deep and meaningful. But I'll come back to this. Here's my definition. Event sourcing is a way of writing to a log. All of us have written log entries, right? Our application print F or something. We all print log entries. But when we write events to the log, those events can be used to trigger commands. How many of us passed our log files to generate reports? All of us, I hope. That's a query handler. It generates reports. But not only can we generate reports, we can look at certain events and react on them. We can also insert new commands into the log so that it triggers other commands. That, in a nutshell, is event sourcing. I know I didn't explain it very well, and I actually confused, conflated CQRS in this definition, command query responsibility, responsibility segregation. But I think the demonstration and the code examples will make it clear. So essentially, it's writing to a law. And it's reading the law. So the persistent distributed law I'll be using for the examples today is a project, it's an open source project. It's called Net Streaming. Um, it's basically a Apache Kafka for Go. It's not Apache Kafka. <coughs> Apache Kafka is a big giant beast with Java fueling it. This is written in Go. It's nice, slim, sexy, fast. <laughs> yeah. So this is not my words. These are lifted from the net streaming website. But essentially, the net streaming server is a log that gets written to the end of the file. Logs don't have unlimited space unless you've got unlimited disk space. Uh, no worries. Oops, oops. Oops, oops. All right. So logs... Whoa, whoa. Logs tend to be purged so that all the entries are get, got, gotten rid of. And we have all, all listened to our bosses to say you must keep logs of a certain size and not, not bigger, or keep logs of a certain age and not older. So net streaming is a fancy log file or log system. So this is how I would start Nets. In fact, here's how I start Nets on this Windows. Uh, that's another story. But I'm running Nets in a Docker container on Windows. Um, so what it says there, I'll just look at my screen. You can look at the slides over here. <coughs> is I create a Docker volume to store my data. This is where my logs are stored. Uh, I run it interactively. For the fun of it, I give it a, give it a host name so that if I SSH or query, if I log into it, when it comes back, when it comes back, I can see that the host name is net streaming. It's an essential part of my infrastructure so that if it dies inadvertently, I always want it to restart. I give it the container name net streaming. Uh, I mount the volume net streaming data into root slash data. I expose one port port 4222, which is the net streaming port. Uh, here's the interesting stuff. File back storage. Store the, store the log files in slash data. Turn off file sync. 
believe that Linux uh, Docker will do its job. Uh, unlimited number of channels or topics or subjects, unlimited number of messages, and unlimited number of bytes. Just for the fun of it. So when it starts up, it looks like this. And it says uh, unlimited, unlimited planet, except for subscriptions. So for every topic you subscribe to, it can by default support a thousand subscribers. Uh, and that I think is a practical limit. So let's talk about Go, because we're at the Go Meetup. So here's a publisher, I'll quickly go over it. Uh, I've highlighted for myself. It needs to talk to the net streaming server. That's the address of my net streaming server on this computer, yes. Is net a Go project or some other language? Net is Go, net streaming is also Go. Good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I looked at it. I love Go. Yeah, I don't want to end up with, you know, some... Java. Java. <laughs> so anyway, oh yeah. Um, if if any of you have any question whatsoever, just interrupt me because I may not see your hands go up. I got my reading glasses. Just shout out, I'll stop and I'll respond to you. I, I like interactive presentations. It's going to be very rather interactive anyway. So I need a net streaming server. That's the address. Connects over port forty two twenty two. Uh, that's how I make a connection. Uh, you need a cluster ID. I never bothered changing the cluster ID, so it's called test cluster. Uh, you need a client ID. So remember, the subscription is limited to a, a thousand, so a thousand unique client IDs because it actually keeps track of it for you. Next, keeps track of it for you. Uh, and then some boilerplate to connect to the server. Um, here is how you publish. This, the, okay, it's called STAN, by the way. SC stands for STAN connection. And it's nasty programmer humor because NATS is oh. fire and forget. STAN, which is the reverse, is fire and remember forever. <laughs> so STAN is net and reverse. So STAN connection is how you publish a message. So this message happens to be JSON encoded. You can use any encoding you want, it doesn't care. But uh, I use JSON because it's machine readable and human readable. I won't run it right now. Instead, I'll look at the subscriber. So by now, some of you are wondering, what's this publish subscribe thing? This is basically a publish subscribe system. You publish to something, it's basically a, like writing onto a whiteboard. And somebody looking at the whiteboard is called subscriber. So it looks at the stuff written on the whiteboard and acts on it. The stuff you write on the whiteboard is your log entry and you're reading the log entry. So that's an essential part of an event sourcing system. So let's jump into how the subscriber works. Uh, okay, here you have your stand connection, blah, blah, blah. But I'll skip over all that boilerplate and focus on start option. <coughs> I'm reading the log. Please deliver all log entries available since the log began. So that what, that's what it means. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff later which I will demonstrate. And I'll also demonstrate this thing durable name. But what do you think will happen if I run this piece of code right now? <coughs> I'm starting a subscriber without starting a publisher. Should I see anything? Technically, logically, no, because no, no, nobody's published anything. Assuming you've never run the publisher before and there's nothing already in there. Ah, ah he's smart. Yeah. Never forever. Ah. Whoops. What's happening here? Um, I ran a subscriber and I've got six, one, two, three, four, five, six entries, six Hello World entries. Um, and at 4.30 UTC, I actually tested it before this presentation. Now let's go back. Remember, we've got six entries on the screen. Let's go back and run the publisher. Please run. It's so slow. Okay, finally ran. So, I just printed hello a few times. It's not, not the time, 11.34 by this clock. And there we are. We're now up to nine entries. 
So that is a published subscribe system. Nothing special, but some people will find this already useful. All right, let's close this. Let's change this. Okay, any mini mini mo. Do you know anything about the latency when you publish something and then it gets sent ah. to the clients when you receive it? I'll I'll talk about that two slides from now. Okay. But right now I want to focus on um, start options. Um, okay. Give me give me a choice. Let's say start at time. Let's, let's try this option. I'm going to change the code on my presentation on the fly. Go present is wonderful. <laughs> so I just changed the code in my presentation. Um, let's say Singapore's National Day, August 9th. From midnight. <laughs> if I run this now, it says Give me everything in the log since August 9th. <coughs> and you'll give me the line entries, I think. Come on, run. It's shy, it's so slow. Okay. Well, the earliest entry happens to be... What is this? August 19th. So if I say August 23rd, the first few entries will disappear. Let's do that. I really must get a faster laptop. Um, how many times have you scanned logs and written your own code to do that and found that you had bugs in date handling routines? All this, all this is built in. You don't have to make those 10 mistakes anymore. <laughs> okay, so let's start at date. But give me everything that happened in the last hour. Give me everything that happened in the last hour. So let's do that. I love Go. Time, hour. If you want to be more specific, one times time, hour. So this will give me everything in the log from the last hour, which should be three entries, I think. Yeah, those three entries. Give me Everything starting from sequence number, well, yeah, sequence number, okay. 7, 8, 9, I remember that. Sequence number 8. So one thing to remember here is every log entry is given an uh, incremental sequence number. So everything starting from sequence number 8, there is. Here's some magic. This is where the client ID comes in. Uh, yeah. Clock distributed, clock skew, confusion. Ah, they, they, it's raft and all those things. Uh, Net streaming in their cluster has taken care of that. Okay. Yeah. So they, they know about that problem with clock skew. Okay. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know whether it's perfect or bug free, but they know of it. They know of the issue. So, um, where was I? Here. Client IDs, start with the last received. <coughs> Net streaming actually keeps track of what I as the client has received. So, it has no entry there. It says, please give me the last thing I, I received. And that should be entry number nine. Entry number nine, come on. There. Okay, did I cover everything else? Deliver all available I have, start at sequence I have. Okay, I'm gonna have deliver all available again. Oops. And now I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna give it an identifier. Short for whiteboard one. Let's see what happens, we will run it. Remember the first time I said deliver all available, nine things came up? Whiteboard 1 has not seen the last three entries. So this is like 
a recording of everything that has been sent to you. So if I now close this and I run the publish again, I run the publish again, it generates three more entries, it generates three more entries. So it's now 9, 10, 11, 12. In NETS, those three entries would have gone into the ether and disappeared. That's a NETS project. NETS streaming, those three entries were written into a log file and kept, hopefully forever, as long as you've got this space. But because the server has recorded, I've asked for it to record those entries in a, in a space which I call whiteboard number one. When I run this again, it won't replay everything else except for those new entries. Please, come on. New entries. 10, 11, 12. Magic. So it, it does all this bookkeeping for you. And this is the power of net streaming. And it's essentially just publish and subscribe. But very, very powerful publish and subscribe at this stage. Good. Any questions? So, just to recap, a durable name, think of it like a whiteboard, which is maintained by the server on your behalf. Um, and the star options, we've talked about it, I've demonstrated it. Very nice. Now to the gentleman's question, latency and benchmarks. And I'm actually going to run a benchmark. This is a horribly slow PC, you agree, right? Um, on my better PC, I could get, uh, I could publish, what, 4,000 messages a second and subscribe to almost 70,000 messages a second. Really nice. Let's actually run it on this crappy old PC and let's see. I think I need to make the fonts slightly bigger. Is it visible now? Good. So we'll run the benchmark. I changed the benchmark from 10,000 to 1,000 messages so that we don't have to wait till the end of the night. It'll, it'll be over in about three seconds. Done. So it, it's actually processed a thousand messages and it's quite decent. It published about a thousand messages per second. It wrote a thousand message entries into the log in one second. The <coughs> benchmark read speed was about 5,000 messages per second, plus minus. Some read faster, some read slower. So it's pretty decent. And in terms of latency, it's the order of millisecond latencies. Some millisecond actually, but millisecond latencies. So that's the latency we're talking about. Write is always slower than read. Read is faster. So let's go back to the presentation. Any questions so far? So back to the definitions. Okay, I hate this. My PC is so slow that Mr. Fowler is. So event sourcing ensures that all application state are stored as a sequence of events. That means, please write everything to a log. Anything important, write it to a log. We can read the log. That's what he says. We can read the log to create application state. In other words, we can read the log to populate the database. We can read old entries in the log so that we can change our database state. That's what Mr. Martin Fowler was trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, of course, write everything to a log. <coughs> By reading the log, we can generate reports. People in the industry call them query handlers. We can also write to the log, but write commands to the log, and when we read those commands, things happen. 
So what are those things that happen? CQRS. I apologize for the small diagram, but essentially there's the command path and the query path. The query path generates reports. The command path writes into the log. This part over here, the write storage and read storage, is handled by NETS streaming. So NETS streaming handles that for you. So recently I came across an assignment and I decided to try using this. So my client said, well, what happened to my client was they are a broadcaster, they bought another broadcaster, and when you buy another broadcaster, you buy a lot of content. And that content has identifiers, and when you try to import those identifiers, you, will try, you want to bring them into your system. So we have a problem of... Boom. We have a problem of renaming. We have a problem of renaming a whole bunch of old IDs to new IDs. So, a command in my system is called map the old ID to new ID, and that would generate a log entry. That log entry is called ID map. Another command in my system would be rename media, actually rename the movie or program from the old ID to the new ID. But all I'm giving you is the old ID. System go and figure out the new ID. And when this rename has been done, it would re result either in rename successful event in the log or rename failed event for whatever reason. My queries in the system would be, please give me the new ID given an old ID. So this, I'm reading the log to generate this. And another one which tell me all the mappings of the old ID to new ID. And then as the project evolves, they will say, please tell me or give me a report of all the renamed jobs done. So let's actually go and implement this in net streaming in a CQRS event sourcing style. So the command to map the old ID to the new ID. So this is a whole bunch of payload, uh, whole bunch of boilerplate. Here's my net server. Here's my payload structure my log entry structure. So, I've read the users inputted. I want to map old ID, old one, two, three, to new ABC. And I'm going to publish it into the log. I'm going to write this entry into the log. I'm not going to run it yet. Instead, I'm going to look at the query handler. So the query handler says, I'm only looking out for the ID map event. <coughs> the ID map event was the event generated from here, ID map. I'm only looking to look out for the ID, ID map event, and I'm going to store it into my database. So I, I was, as I was doing this project, I was wondering what database to use. SQL database, uh, a NoSQL database. Uh, then I decided, Excel, oh, not Excel. <laughs> then I decided, well, um, what's the fastest database you can think of? <coughs> it's basically just a, a map entry. So I stuck the thing into a map. All I did was I created a map called ID map, and I stuck old ID with the value new ID. And of course, even though uh, there are concurrent maps in Go right now, I decided not to use the concurrent map so I need to protect access to this map. So ID lock, ID unlock. <laughs> so I won't run this yet. Let's continue. How does the external world look at it? So those, for you, oh, those of you who are new to Go, I'm writing a web server right now with a service endpoint. It's like, it's exactly five lines of code. It's tiny. Uh, okay, no GS is two lines of code. Sorry. <laughs> so basically, what it says is here's the ID endpoint. 
here's the idea and point. Given a response writer and a request, HTTP request, look for the ID value, which you submit. And then it goes and looks at the ID map and gets the value. So retrieval from a map is almost instantaneous. It's memory retrieval. Get all the IDs in the system. What it does is it ranges over the map. That's all it does. Ranges of the map itself select staff from whatever table, order by. This is just ranges of the map. So let's test out the new ID function. So first run map old ID to new ID and then all that. So I'll copy this to save some typing. I will write my log entry. Write my log entry. Okay, I've written my log entry. So it basically says at this time I've written ID event mapped, ID mapped, old ID, new ID. I'm going to run my query handler now. It's not going to be very exciting. All it says is, I'm ready to respond to queries. That's new for old query handler. That's all it says. But I'm going to use curl. So basically it says curl localhost. Giving a new ID for O123, old ID. There it is. Uh, tell me all the IDs. Oh, I actually put in some other IDs there. Remember, it's a log file. It remembers things. As long as there's this space, it remembers stuff. So let's add a new entry for the fun of it. Poll one two five ZBC. Run this. <coughs> I'm not going to use this laptop for presentations anymore. <laughs> It works. Uh, give me all the IDs. It's actually pretty fast. It just runs Go present really slow. So I've just entered 0125 and you get ZBC there. Okay, the reason why Go present was so slow and the reason why I can actually run my presentation is it compiles the code on the fly and puts it in the temporary folder and runs the compile code. So it's doing all that time in a few seconds. In a fast PC, it would be unnoticeable. In a slow PC, it's noticeable. Okay. So what have we seen? We have seen something right to the log and a way to query the log. So we have, we have seen query handlers. Let's look at the renamer now, a command handler. So rename media is a command. It renames medias, media files. And it listens for log entries called rename requested. So somebody writes, please rename this for me. And the command handler will pick up the log entry and do something with it. Rename a file with it. So this is how that command handler works. It listens out for rename requested. It only responds to rename requested. Other things may be the log, but it ignores it. It only responds to rename requested. It creates a rename event if it's successful, but it doesn't write that yet. And you will publish, if it is successful, you will publish the rename event. So it's called a reactor because it reacts to events in the log. Um, and here's where I use that whiteboard permanent thing. I don't want to rename things twice. Right? So it's persistent. It, it stores state. So I, I store durable name whiteboard one. I won't run it yet. Let's look at the rename service endpoint. 
So here is my name function. I will post to it. Uh, and my payload basically writes a log entry saying rename requested. So whenever I post to this endpoint, it will write a log entry saying rename requested. Let's run this. Okay, run the command handler. Nothing much interesting is going to happen right now. It just says command handler ready. Okay, command handler ready. Well, actually, there was a name request later, earlier, which I did. All right, let's ignore that for the time being and do that again. So all I'm doing here is curl a post event to the endpoint we name, old ID, new ID. And when I post it, it says the rename requested event has been created. If I go back to my presentation, that was the latest rename entry. So that's a command handler in the simplest form. Did I lose anybody? <coughs> no? Good. So, back to requirements from my vendor, uh, from my client, sorry, I'm the vendor. How am I going to give me a report? Please give me a report of all the rename requests. How will you do it? Please give me a report of all the rename jobs. When it was submitted, when it was renamed, whether it was renamed successfully or whether it failed. If you're doing it in a traditional way, you have to query a database, right? It's, it's quite a mess. You forget to track something in your database, it's gone because all that data is there. But in an event sourcing system, the data is always in the log. So all you have to do is read the log again. So, can you write this? Given events written to the log, the log entries rename requested. It has a timestamp. It's got the event type. The command handler has written entry saying, I successfully renamed or I failed to rename. So this is a simple way of just scanning through the log and generating the report. No big deal. I'll leave this as an exercise for you if you want. As always, if you choose to accept your mission, <laughs> the code is on GitHub. Um, it's present GoNet streaming. And I'm Suyin. Thank you. Comments, questions? Yes. Before you go, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned you did this for your client, right? Yes. Uh, do you do it with net streaming? Yes. So, how many events do you actually store in the net streaming database? Okay, um, this, this database has about 70,000 events. It's quite small. Um, I ingested 70,000 events on the production machine in about two seconds. So it's pretty performant. So do, you, do you know if it will perform in like super large scale like event? No. no. Um, Net streaming is designed not, it's not a Apache Kafka. Uh, Net streaming can run as a cluster. You can put three machines, but that guarantees availability. You can run it on Kubernetes. If one of the nodes go down, you continue to run, but it doesn't scale. Not yet. Not yet. Doesn't scale Kafka style yet. Actually, my question is more like, how many events do you think net streaming yield? Oh, if you can wait, unlimited. <laughs> Well, 70,000 events, two seconds. You figure out how, much, how long you're willing to wait. Because, I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite familiar with the concept of uh, event sourcing. So, um, right. it's, it's actually, I mean, uh, net streaming is quite new to me. So, uh, I mean, I've never really used Kafka for event sourcing. Either. But, uh, I mean, mainly it's because uh, I, I've never seen any actual workloads in terms of event sourcing. Well, I'm wondering if you... Here's, here's an actual <laughs> workload. So far, it has been very performant. Um, so far, no nasty surprises. Um, no nasty surprises. Um, the, the choice of a memory-based database 
was a bit controversial at least for me initially when I started. But if I load the entire database in two seconds, I, I don't care if the database is thrown away, recreated from the log every time I start up. Performance from the memory bank database is instantaneous. My clients have never seen anything so fast in their lives. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you create checkpoints in your data? I mean, do you create checkpoints in your data? Checkpoints as in? Uh, yeah, I mean, the state. Uh, okay. And how, how frequently do you do this? For and some. do you store it? Okay. For, for <coughs> event sourcing, I'll, I'll rewind the question a little bit, step back a little bit. Event sourcing comes from the accounting world. Right? You write a ledger. And at the end of the accounting year, you close your books. So that is a way of thinking of it as a checkpoint. For 70,000 events, uh, uh, it's too much hassle to write a checkpoint. I would, I would consider writing a checkpoint every million events or so. Uh, but my client is not that big. Their library is not that big. So I just read, I never close my books. I just read the law as is. So to answer your question, no, I won't return a checkpoint. So every single time the read request, the query request comes, comes in, you replay all log? Uh, no. Um, ah, you have a cache in, in memory. Correct. My query handler cache that in memory. Since it's order of 100,000 events, okay. it's really small. So I mean, but if, if the, your container, if you're at the chain, Ah, So right? if you are Grab, my friends from Grab, He's got millions of events every day, right? I wouldn't put that in memory, and then my computer is not going to be that big. So I'll have a proper database back on a disk somewhere. The query handler can be a NoSQL database, this is what I, exactly what I did, key value pair, that's all I did. It can be a relational database if you want it to be. It can be a graph database. By the way, check out dgraph, it's really nice. Yes. No, I'm just, uh, dgraph is awesome. Yeah, dgraph is really nice. If you want a d, um, I had projects where I had joins like six or seven tables deep. That was a simple join. <laughs> uh, dgraph would be super in that environment. I had to perform that in a relational database. Yes? Uh, two small questions. Is it possible to tag entries? For instance, you have a, a few million events over a day, but like 10 of them are special, and you want to be able to request give me everything until the last special event. So could you put a tag on an event and say, this is a special one? Um, you can ask for, for it without knowing exactly like, what time it happens. Sort of like a keyframe, if you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The answer is, Yes and no, of course. It's always yes and no. Net streaming doesn't give you that facility, but you can write a ridiculously simple query handler, look out for the events, take it into a map, and it's done. That was the, the second question. Is there a way, like a hook system, that I can put things into the streaming server that are run locally on the streaming server, but they run like hook without the need of processing a specific event? Uh, no. By design, and Kafka doesn't give you this facility as well. By design, it's a log. The log doesn't have run hooks. So it just writes a log, and you read from the log. They want to keep the model conceptually super simple. Write to a log, read from the log. That's it. So no, it's, it's not an all bells and whistles event processing system. Not so I have one question since you've been looking at Nets, and I only discovered when I saw your, your, the top of your conversation. Um, you said, as of now, it doesn't really support big clusters for uh, performance scaling, uh, only for high ability, high ability is what they have. Yeah. Do you know if it is a plan to be able to scale out? Um, the plan to scale out, mm -hmm. but I think some of you I've met in the Prometheus uh, meetup as well. Uh, Prometheus doesn't scale the same way net streaming doesn't scale. Which means to say, 
you can have a tree of Prometheus clusters uh, and it can cover your entire worldwide infrastructure with billions of events, but the individual node doesn't scale. Okay. But you need to consolidate. So in the same way, you can have a tree of nets clusters. Those are, these things are cheap to spin. Yeah. This this tiny obsolete laptop can easily run a hundred copies of it. Which at that point now you're looking at running your own like time vector for serializing across your clusters. Time skew and all that. Not, yeah. That's where that's where that problem. Okay. Yeah. That's not a trivial problem. <laughs> that's not trivial. Yeah. It's not trivial. Uh, we're talking about atomic time kind of skew position there. It's, it's a tough problem in concurrency, uh, in distributed. distributed computing. It's a tough problem. Any other questions? If not, Dan should be coming up. You have a, yeah. Let me just, uh, sorry about the limited pizza. We apparently have had uh, 